Well, it's still Thanksgiving weekend, and so I hope it's not too late to give thanks. And as uh, one of the things that I'm most thankful for, probably one of the greatest gifts that anybody can receive is uh, being born and having a wonderful mom and dad um, who took care of me. You know, they, they certainly weren't perfect, uh, as no parent in this world is, except our Heavenly Father, uh, but they were a wonderful blessing to me. And we, it's not that, um, I, by that I don't mean that I, you know, that I was fed with, a, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I, I felt like as a kid anyway, we had less than, less fun stuff than my friends, uh, but my parents knew what was really important and, 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 uh, and loved us and were there for us. And that's, you know, so important. And there's really not much better in this life than you can ask for than that. And um, now also having had that, I also know that that's not the case for everybody, unfortunately. Not everybody grows up in that situation, and, and through no fault of their own, some people are born into difficult situations where um, things are not stable, where there are problems and issues. And to me, anyway, as we talk about injustice, that's really one of the greatest injustices of all, one of the really unfortunate or terrible parts about uh, living in this world and, and injustices, kids who have, uh, who, who are born into, through no fault of their own, uh, a tough situation, um, which is also uh, why I say having uh, good parents, a good family, is one of the greatest advantages you can possibly have. Um, now, uh, as we talk about justice and injustice, uh, oops, oh, I got to turn it on. There we go. Um, uh, Isaiah talks about justice and injustice throughout his book, and Isaiah has to deal with a variety of people, uh, and he is a counselor of kings, and some of the kings are pretty good, but a lot of them are pretty terrible, and he has to tell them to stop doing pretty basic things. He has to warn them against idolatry and a lot of the same sorts of things, sexual immorality and unfaithfulness to Yahweh and trusting in. Isaiah has to talk to one king who pretends to be very pious, but it really uh, is, is just mouthing the words and he does the exact opposite of what Yahweh actually says. And that's very frustrating. For uh, And then later he deals with just blatantly evil kings who don't care what he, he says. So Isaiah, like a lot of these prophets that we've been talking about, cares a lot about justice and injustice. And one of the things that I think is important for us to try to wrestle with as Christians, because today's focus is, is especially on kind of what's our response or how do we deal with it, um, I want to do something about what I consider, and maybe some of you agree, one of the biggest injustices in this world. And so that's why we're considering, and we'll be considering more seriously, this organization called Fathers in the Field, which is about um, coming alongside uh, families uh, where the father is not there for one reason or the other, and uh, mentoring them. And, and again, it's not just, it's, it's coming alongside and working with the families and working with, in this case, uh, young men or boys, and so maybe this isn't what we should do. I think it's very worth considering, though. I think we're gonna we're gonna give it our, our best shot here, um, and uh, that's perhaps part of our answer to injustice. It's a big problem, and again, one of the things that I want to focus on is uh, is doing something about it. We know there's a problem, so what are we doing about it? Um, because justice is not just knowing what the problem is. It's not just being aware that there's an issue out there, but important aspect of justice is having the ability and the, the follow-through to begin fixing or resolving this situation. That's a key part of justice. It's not just, and this is very biblical, this is not just, it's not just a concept, okay, here's right and here's wrong, but part of Isaiah's concern and the prophet's concern is, the king, here's what should be doing, should be happening, and the kings aren't doing it. Or today, Isaiah says, here's what, you know something's wrong, so why aren't you, God, doing anything 
about it. Um, well, as I said, uh, Isaiah talks about injustice, um, and he doesn't just limit it to theological justice, although there certainly is concepts of the most important concept being faithful to the Lord. But it turns out when you're unfaithful to the Lord, you start sinning not only against the Lord, but against other people too. And so like many of the prophets, there's a concern for the poor um, prophets of a similar time period, say similar sorts of things. So we know this is really an issue going on in Israel and Judah for Isaiah at this time. Um, so he, Isaiah doesn't just condemn broadly, but he condemns uh, the abuse of individuals, not just false worship, although clearly that is the heart of the issue and the most important part. Um, but again, Isaiah, in, in our reading, he talks about this and says, um, you're, you are just, O Lord, you're, you're good. And so um, when uh, Isaiah is um, overwhelmed uh, by the pain and injustice of the world around him, Isaiah says to God, why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you fixing what's out there? I know that you're capable. I know that you're powerful. I believe in you. It's not that I doubt you, Lord, but I, I, I don't know what's going on right now. The beginning of our particular verses in Isaiah talks about, um, you maybe are familiar with um, at a, a sporting event or at a music concert or something, usually they have a big introduction, right? The, the, at a big and important game or a giant, they, they might have the smoke screen, they have a, a booming voice and, and special effects to announce the arrival of the, the main act uh, to the concert or of the starting lineup uh, for the, the playoff game or whatever, and they pull out all stops so everyone's really pumped up and you got, again, you got the special music, the flashing lights, the smoke, all of it. Well, that's exactly what Isaiah describes, basically, in Isaiah chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heaven. Oh, that you would just rip open heaven and, and jump down and the earth would shake when you land. As, as come down as when fire kindles brush wood and, you know, it sets it on fire. And, and when God comes down, he's so, you know, we still say someone's on fire in sports today if someone's doing really good. And that's kind of, you know, what Isaiah is saying here. He says, uh, God is so, he's coming in so hot that when he lands, uh, the, the brushwood starts on fire. God is so hot that when he comes to earth, uh, he's going to make the water, the puddles are going to start boiling because that's how on fire, how powerful, how mighty God is. And all the nations will tremble at your presence. Um, Isaiah says, when you did awesome things, which we didn't look for, uh, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. Again, this is really a lot like an introduction to a sporting event uh, or a big event and building up uh, Yahweh and how powerful he is. Um, so, um, but Isaiah continues, he says, you're, like, you're unlike any other God. You know, what other God is like you, he says, that actually comes down and, and does stuff in history, you know, there's a reason why other religions, so many other religions, want to piggyback off the Bible and, and, and if not the New Testament, the very least the Old Testament, because it's really, it's unrivaled. It, it, even if you don't believe it's true, the claims that the Old Testament makes are, are stupendous. It says that God himself is actually coming down and doing something. Um, and that's what Isaiah says. He says, you have no rival. There's, there's no one who can step up to you because you're a God that actually steps into history and does something. You know, you think of the stories like the Red Sea. I mean, the Israelites are slaves backed up against the Red Sea with the mightiest army in the world facing them. And what happens? So they, don't, they don't strike a single blow. The Lord opens up the sea and closes it up behind them. Uh, when they march to Jericho, to what seems like at that time this, uh, an insurmountable wall surrounding the city of Jericho, what do they do? They march around and they, they shout, 
and the Lord knocks the walls over. I mean, you look at David's odds, and now in sports they have these odds, in-game odds, chances of this person to win. It's interesting to me, even I'm not a, I don't really do much betting, but it's kind of funny to watch the, uh, the, what percentage this team has. When David faces off Goliath, it was probably like 99% uh, or 0%. If you just looked at what was happening, here's a boy with a sling, and here's a giant with all this, every advantage you can think of. Um, and, and yet, who wins? It's David. And David says himself, it's not me. Uh, it's not because of what I, the weapons I bring. It's not just because I'm a great slingshot warrior. It's because the Lord is with me. And that's the story throughout. You look at judges, look at folks like Gideon, who's afraid to go to battle, and yet the Lord has to keep pulling him along, and, and they gain a victory. All of Israel's most impressive victories are not impressive in the way the other nation's victories are. They're not because Israel is so mighty or powerful. It's because there's no other answer for the victory except that the Lord has done something. No. And, and the, all of this right now is bothering Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 64. Because again, he says, Lord, I know who you are. I know what you've done. And so I know that you're capable of doing something. So why aren't you? Why is this world so, why are your people so messed up? Why are there so many problems? Why are, Isaiah's looking to the future, why are you letting so many terrible things, so many problems come towards us? You are a God who saves your people, and that's what makes you different from all the other nations. Oh, again, look at what the foreign nations, the religions at this time, what they're doing. Nobody even makes the claims that God is fighting for them in this direct way. Instead, they have to rely on interpreting omens or interpreting the actions of, of individuals. Um, but again, that's not the story. Even in their, their legends, you know, it's, it's the gods acting through people or, you know, but here God is regularly stepping into Israel's history and saving them. Um, and Isaiah's wondering, so if you're, all, if you're, I know who you are, I know what you've done, why aren't you doing something now? Right, this still kind of the question that bothers many people today. If there's a God, and if he's just, and if he knows what's going on, and if he's powerful, why do we have these problems? Why is there so much turmoil? Why is this wrong? Why is that wrong? Why did this go this way when I wanted it to go the other way? Um, and so, uh, that's why um, knowing God makes, and knowing who he is, the more you know God, I think the harder injustice is to swallow. It's not easier. It, it, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that understanding the problem of pain and the tension of this world, it doesn't really make it necessarily any easier. I think in some ways it makes it harder because, you know, if it's just a random accident, then, you know, why would you expect anything to be good? Why would you expect there to be justice if it's just Whoever's the, you know, if it's the survival of the fittest, well, of course, there's not going to be justice. In fact, I don't know why you'd care, you know, if it's just the survival of the fittest, who cares? You know, this guy was stronger, this girl was stronger, they got what they wanted. Well, that's how life works, right? But that's not what we believe. We believe there is a right and wrong. We believe there is a God. And so it makes the problem of injustice harder um, uh, to wrestle with. Um, uh, and so... God, Isaiah is wrestling and pleading. Isaiah's answer to all this is to plead with the Lord, um, which one, I think it's kind of comforting to know that Isaiah is this great prophet. He's seen all of what God has done, and yet he still has his doubts. And two, he also, you know, almost complains a little bit to the Lord about what's going on and pleads with the Lord to do something, which I think gives us permission and maybe even an example of how one of the ways we as God's people ought to interact with this world, and that's to one, recognize uh, that it's not a, it's, things don't always go the way they ought to go, and what should we do about one of the answers is clearly to plead for justice, because we can't, you know, it's not the job of Christianity 
and the New Testament and Jesus, they're not trying necessarily to solve or resolve the tension of this world and, and make it seem like everything's okay. Right? That's not what Christianity... Sometimes people complain about Christianity as if or about the existence of God or whatever. But that's really not Christianity. It's not trying. We want, <laughs> we want the tension to be resolved. We want things to be fixed. We want to feel better about life. But the New Testament really isn't promising us that. It isn't telling us, oh, life is okay. Everything's fine. Everything's good. That's what we want. And that's what we want to hear. But what the, Bi- what, what the New Testament tells us is, you're right. Uh, if, if you're feeling pain and injustice, there are problems. This world is screwed up. It's messed up. Um, and there's only one solution to that, and it's not going to come from this policy or that policy. It's only going to come through God's, exactly what Isaiah wants. It's only going to come when God resolves uh, the tension. Um, and um, uh, God, Isaiah, again, is asking, pleading for God to show up. He says, just come down, man. Just come down. God, rip open the heavens, land, shake the earth, and fix things. Uh, Isaiah wants God to come down in power and in majesty. Um, however, Yahweh's answer is no. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of yes and no. Uh, but he, he doesn't, in Isaiah's day, for instance, he doesn't come down the way Isaiah wants him to. Um, he doesn't come in and sweep away all the problems right away. He doesn't come down and make this, uh, you know, his presence felt in a more obvious way. Um, uh, and this same, as I was saying, this tension for God's people for the Old Testament, which, which admittedly they've kind of brought on themselves with their sins. As Isaiah himself says, all our righteous acts are like polluted rags, God. We, we don't have any righteous acts, and the, the things we call good are actually not good. Um, and yet, uh, so God doesn't come down uh, in the way that Isaiah wants him to. Um, Isaiah, God says, no, I, I won't come in power and might, uh, but I will come to rescue, redeem, and restore. Um, we want God to rescue, redeem, and restore. But the way, again, we would rather have victory is through an obvious win, right? When I'm a big sports fan, when I cheer for my sports teams, and they, they give me plenty of good reasons to be humbled, um, is uh, I don't want them to lose. I want them to win, and I want them to, to win big. I don't really, ah, I don't want to hear about when they lose, how they need to learn from this loss. I just want them to win, right? Well, Isaiah, in God's answer, basically to all of humankind, in a sense, is, you know, you know what? You're going to have to learn through some of the losses. I'm not going to come down and just give you a great big victory because you wouldn't learn that way, and the problem wouldn't really uh, be fixed. Um, we want uh, power and might, but what we get is Jesus, and that's good. It doesn't always look as impressive. It doesn't always look like a win. But that is God's answer uh, to injustice. Um, uh, We know that life is not always a basket of peaches and gravy or whatever. It's it's not always good or fun. And that's, it's okay to be honest about that as Christians. It's okay to be honest and say, life is not good. I don't like what's going on. Um, and part of our answer is simply to ask for God's intervention, for ask Him to help. And uh, we probably want to pray like our Lord and Thy will be done. That's why we say it every every week in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will uh, be done. We want God to come, but we, having the advantage of seeing the New Testament and the Old Testament for that matter, but especially Jesus, uh, we know that the way that God acts is not always what we expect. And the victory we want is not always the the victory that we get. Um, God's real answer to injustice um, is uh, is one that we cry out for mercy, that we ask the Lord, you know, that's why it's such a great phrase, Lord, have mercy. 
that we want, the word mercy kind of implies God's undeserved actions. Mercy kind of implies action, that God's going to do something, that he's going to resolve something. So when we have a prayer request, we say, Lord, have mercy. Not only, don't just hear us, because that's not what we want, right? We don't just want, it's nice to have someone hear you, but that's not all we want. We don't want God just to hear us. We want him to do something about it. Um, and, and so when you want something done, you got to go to the right person, right? If you make a phone call and you have some issue with a product you bought and it's not operating the way you want, you know, you, sometimes the first person you talk to can help you. But if it's a real issue and you want something fixed, not just I misunderstood something, sometimes they'll help you like, okay, well, you need to press this button, you know, bozo, you know, read the instructions and we'll get you on track. But a lot of times, if you called up, it's because there's something really wrong. And explaining something isn't going to help you. You don't need an explanation. You want something fixed. And so you got to go to, can I talk to your manager? You know, who can fix this for me? You want to know, right? And that's why it's so important when things are going wrong in this world that we go to the God who can fix things. It's... Uh, if you have problems in life, the first question, which we probably don't ask ourselves, but we need to ask ourselves is, have I talked to God yet? Have I asked God about this situation? You know, if it's something you can't fix, your best bet is the Lord. And when we have problems, we need to make sure that we're, we're going to the Lord because he wants to hear us, right? We've got the ear of the, who, what God is like our God, to quote Isaiah, who comes down and actually helps his people. So we want to make sure that as we struggle with injustice and we see, again, I don't know what that, there's all kinds of injustice, uh, but when there's things that we're struggling with, make sure you're going to the Lord and asking for his help because he's the one who's most capable of fixing and resolving situations. He's the one who's got the authority um, and the power. Um, but uh, as I said, the answer to God's question is not a straightforward to Isaiah, is not a straightforward yes. It's kind of a, a no or at least wait for the yes. And we know that the real answer, the only real solution, I mean, even to the problems that are going on around us today, you know, whatever that may be, COVID, or uh, the economy that's falling, all these kinds of things, God's most, co most complete answer is in Jesus. And it's in Christ crucified and, and resurrected. Um, that's God's answer to the ills of this world, is that the only real full-scale solution is going to come when Jesus returns. We're in that part of the church here where we talk about Jesus, uh, his return, the last day, and why we look forward to that day is because that's when God's going to fix all the issues, all the problems um, that are going on around us. Um, and again, the way God has started that is, is through the cross. And God didn't come and win a great victory in the way we might expect him to. Rather, he came humble. Uh, because when God came down, right, we're in manger time of year, um, and uh, when God came down, it didn't look all that impressive. I mean, technically, God rended open, you know, he ripped open the heavens, sort of, because the angels announced, but who were they? they were just announcing to a couple shepherds, right? Uh, so technically, Isaiah gets a yes, but it's not something that anybody of note from the world's perspective notices. Uh, it's just some shepherds and some sheep. The only one who, besides you know, Mary and Joseph, if he hadn't fainted, who saw the actual arrival of God come to earth were, you know, whatever animals were present in that, you know, manger, in that, um, in that, uh, in that cave and probably cave or barn uh, where Mary and Joseph were staying. Uh, of course, that's not even as humble as it gets, right? That's pretty humble. I mean, you, you wouldn't think looking at a at a baby lying in a, in a feeding trough, uh, that that would be the king of the world, that this would be God's answer to the problem of, 
of pain, that this little baby was going to be the defeat of death, right? But that's what God's plan was. And we see it, and we see the love of God and the disarming of this world's powers uh, in the cross where Jesus is even more humbled, probably the only, you know, he's probably wearing even less than he was those, those swaddling clothes as he's hung on the cross, uh, dying for our salvation and for the rescue and the remaking uh, of this world. Um, and that's important for Christians to hold on to, uh, that we know that the real final um, resolution comes about through what God has accomplished in Christ crucified. And what looks like weakness and foolishness to the world is the way in which God uh, has brought about salvation and redemption. Um, now, having said that, we also know that, again, the other part of that answer, you know, I like to say that God has given us the big picture, big, fully satisfying answer in Christ um, and when he returns. But in the meantime, he's also given us smaller answers to the hurts and problems in this world. And that's why the, you know, the, the real solution, the Christian answer to injustice is first and foremost the cross, um, but then secondarily, the answer is not a philosophical answer. It's not a doctrine. The real answer to injustice is not a Christian anything. It's just a Christian. We, as the body of Christ, are part of God's solution. We are the world's best chance uh, at seeing some hope this side of heaven. And so we are the hands and feet of Jesus, right? We're the body of Christ. We're the representation, imperfect though we are, of, of our Lord's plans on earth. That's the real concrete, the real flesh and blood, if you will, answer to injustice is us. We are uh, imperfect, certainly. We're not going to fix everything, and we know that up front. We know that the only real solution comes to Jesus but, the, but that doesn't mean that we give up or we don't try to fix the world or to provide humbly knowing that we're not going to fix everything, but that we might make a difference nonetheless. That we might help a little bit, uh, and we might provide some really helpful uh, relief to those who are hurting and in trouble. Um, and that's uh, an important part of, of the Christian answer to injustice as well. We know this is not going to be something that we do perfectly, and, and it's, not, it's not how we're saved. We know that clearly we're saved by grace. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we are called upon as a witness uh, to what God has already done for us and as a small reflection of the kind of love that God has that we are to reach out uh, to the world around us. Uh, we do so with God's help, with His Holy Spirit, and with his grace, knowing that all along that it's not our works that get us there, but nonetheless God has given us good works uh, that we ought to do uh, to help this world. In, in Jesus' name, amen.